I believe it was three, uh, now it might be two, uh, which will be an interesting opportunity that I'll talk about in a second, uh, local businesses. So the format is going to be pretty simple. Uh, we're going to have a five minute pitch from each of the entrepreneurs, and uh, then we will have a five minute feedback session from the panelists. And the feedback will be open so they can have as uh, lively a dialogue as they'd like to have uh, to give some great uh, insight to, the, uh, to these entrepreneurs. Um, there is, I will say up front, there is certainly no requirement that any investments be made here, uh, but all these folks are bona fide investors who uh, do deals all the time. And actually last year we had an investment. So um, it, it happens here. Um, all right, so um, we're going to let them sit up, but we're going to have introductions from the panelists uh, in just a minute. Uh, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Nick Farina. Um, I'm the CEO of uh, Gifted Hire. Uh, and actually just raised uh, $100,000 myself a few uh, months ago, so I've been in, this, uh, been in these shoes pretty recently. <laughs> um, and I've been an entrepreneur for, for some time before that. All right, so do we, uh, without uh, further ado here, let's uh, do introductions uh, from uh, each of our esteemed panelists. Um, I'm Anne-Marie, the CEO of Managing Partner of Tribal Ventures, and I'm Troy Hennikoff, Managing Director at Techstars, uh, Angel and Venture Investor. Henry Bosk is founder and CEO of Early Bird, uh, an agency uh, that helps startups and offer products for non technical founders and uh, get early stage seed funding. I'm Shraddha, co founder of Context Media. We partner with healthcare systems and division offices to provide educational technology and product care and video. So Speak up, please. All right, that was just a test run then. I am Shraddha. I'm co-founder of Context Media. We partner with physician practices to provide educational technology to um, show videos on chronic care management during their visit. I'm also co-founder of Concert Ventures, and we invest in early stage, primarily healthcare and education companies, especially with Midwest and Japan. Can hear all that? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and just to note, uh, we did not mean to offend anybody by having the backs here. The reason is so that the investors can see the slides as they're being presented. Um, so there's plenty of room on the side of the room if you'd like to, like to head over here. Uh, but that's why we did that. Um, okay, so we're going to have our uh, first uh, presenter come up here and give a five minute pitch. Our value proposition 
is that we have the lightest weight system. This lowers the cost to put a green roof on new construction and also opens the market up to existing buildings, which might not be a structural retrofit. We also offer more plant choices, going far beyond sedum, which is the typical green roof plant, that includes food production. So we're providing a source in potentially of rental income to building owners who choose to lease their green roofs to roof farmers. This can uh, improve the ROI from over 20 years for a green roof to less than 10 years for your payback. And we do all this through a turnkey service. We do the manufacturing, design, design installation, and maintenance service. And we also use full coverage plantings that uh, lowers the risk of wind erosion, like the issues that you saw in the early parts of these pictures. We use easily removable trays so that uh, should a roof leak occur, which is very unlikely because greeners actually protect roof membranes from damage, um, we can easily pop those trays out and fix it. Also, on all environmental metrics, our system outperforms our competitors. Um, on an energy level, we not only reduce the temperature of a roof below a black rooftop, also below a white rooftop, also below all of our competitors, and we just finished a study that shows we actually reduce it below air temperature. So in the summer, um, there's very little air conditioning costs. Additionally, we reduce stormwater more per inch of growing media than our competitors. There's absolutely no greater technology that performs better than ours. But we have a very complicated sales process. We sell to institutional, commercial, and residential customers, and there are nine decision makers in every sale. We have contractors, like general contractors, roofing contractors, and landscape contractors, that are actually signing the checks to pay for the materials and the services that we provide. But we have decision makers that are included in architects, landscape architects, and developers. Ultimately, there are other decision makers too, which are the end users, like owners and occupants. The market size in the United States and Canada is $150 million. We expect it to go up to $200 million in the next two years. And in Chicago, it's about $15 million, expected, expected to go up to $20 million in the next two years. Our revenue for the last three years has been around $300,000, but the sales, cycle, the sales cycles are six to 24 months, so we've already signed over a half million dollars of contracts for next year and we still have a window of opportunity to continue those sales, so we'll likely be over a million in the next year. Uh, in 2016, we can see that potentially going as high as over $2 million. The cost to acquire customers this year has gone up because we've invested in trade shows, in our online presence, and in um, instructional videos, as well as targeted marketing campaign. So we expect that the increased volume of sales or customer acquisition costs to go down our accomplishments are that we've developed our intellectual portfolio. Our intellectual property portfolio, we have dozens of notable projects, and we have many awards, including last year we won an elevator pitch at this event. Our team is a group of folks with backgrounds in environmental science and construction. Everyone's worked in the industry for five to 25 years. And so our ask today is for you guys to connect us to your network. Uh, we're looking for connections to architects, developers, and building owners. So to existing projects, like contractors who are building uh, projects that have greater zone now. As well as we look for any support, free support, on um, ideas on how to get our online presence improved. And then everyone in the room, we ask you guys to be advocates for smart environmental change. Thank you so much. I love what you're doing, and I love the concept of green roofs and sustainability. Um, what was unclear to me is, how are you actually acquiring customers? When I look at these early stage businesses, there's such a high correlation between those that are successful and those that have built into their DNA a process for how we're going to acquire and retain customers. So how do you go about getting your customers? Sure. So um, we reach out to architects. We give lunch and learn to their offices where we present to them about our technology, provide a lunch to them. We also um, meet with general contractors and roofing contractors to um, ask them on existing projects that are already specified but not built yet to substitute our projects in, our products in. 
and we also go directly to developers and home and owners. So I have um, I won the ULI, which is the Urban Land Institute Young Visionary Award, and that's basically the network of all the major developers in the city. So now we have connections with many of them, and so they're choosing our system over other systems. Great presentation. Visuals all on top, and of course we had a lot of numbers there, which I know Troy does too. Um, two questions related. One, you mentioned your revenue so far. How many buildings does that represent? And two, what's your revenue revenue in the building? What's the size of this year? What was the second question? What's your recurring revenue from the building once they've signed up with you? Right. So uh, we've done about a dozen to 15 projects a year for the past three years. Um, and recurring revenue, we have ongoing maintenance contracts, which can vary from anywhere from about $3,000 to $12,000 annually um, from, for each project. Generally, we see repeat customers, not from the building owners themselves, but the architects or developers. So those in the industry who are constantly moving from new project to new project. Those are our recurring clients. Great presentation. Um, I think with a market like this, there's one uh, one challenge that's going to be really tough is educating the market. You're, uh, people don't have preconceived notions about the green roofs uh, unless they're industry insiders. Um, so you're going to bear some of those costs. And unless you have an advantage in being a monopoly later on, it's expensive to bear those costs. How are you approaching educating the market and who, who is your target audience? That's an excellent question. Uh, we have borne the, the brunt of that, and I think you can see that in our customer acquisition costs and how high they are per uh, customer. And we spend a lot of time doing educational events. Um, we try and target that to technical audiences, so architects, landscape architects, who are yeah. dealing with product specification and construction materials. Uh, so there's less of an educational hurdle to get over with the technical audience. I think that's one thing that, we're, that we've done successfully in the past. Um, the area where we see a lot of improvement uh, that we need is with turning those live presentations that we do into online videos. So we're actually in the process of turning um, a 30-minute like lunch presentation into three 10-minute sections uh, with a two-minute teaser. So that the, uh, especially the two-minute teaser is good for non-technical, but then the 30-minute in-depth can transfer that knowledge without actually occupying our limited sales markets. Sales team's time. It's tough though. Um, I have a question for you. Of the percentages of the roofs in Chicago, that um, how many are green, and what what's the new, you know, what, what do you perceive or project to happen in the next year? As well as, um, is there a way to kind of lure people in by giving them tax benefits of some sort? Yes. Um, so the first question is, um, in the city of Chicago, there's about uh, six hundred thousand square feet of green roofs built annually, and that's been happening for the last five years. Uh, we see that going up to at least uh, three quarters of a million in the next two years, uh, based on what we see in projected uh, construction projects moving forward. Um, we hope that this food roof technology that we develop, where we can actually farm roofs and thereby lower the ROI for the green roof, will encourage far more, and we're hoping that that will really explode the market size. Um, uh, and the policy was the other thing, right? Um, right now there is policy in Chicago to incentivize green roofs, so developers get expedited permits, um, and they can also change their zoning if they agree to put green roofs on their buildings for new construction. Um, so that has encouraged developers to put very low-cost green roofs on, so it means that they blow away or they look really terrible. Um, I think what we really need uh, for this market is a policy that encourages the performance side, not just checking box. You had an ask, and that was for connections, and if you come up to me afterwards, I have a couple that I think would be good for you. Appreciate it. Thank you. set up. We, the third presenter was not able to come today. Uh, so what that means is that for our third pitch, uh, we're going to invite an audience member uh, to come up and give their pitch. 
Um, now, uh, to make this fair, uh, we uh, want to uh, make sure that we have uh, some of these screenings because it's totally random. Um, so I believe everyone has a piece of paper um, at their at their seat um, and uh, should have a, a pen if, if not we can ask your neighbor hopefully they'll uh, find one uh, find one soon I know I have one to pass out um, you don't have, you, you can't use those the paper at your seat it's just a little piece of white paper we just need one sentence There's room on that paper, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're gonna need to write one sentence about what your business does, um, and uh, then from that, uh, we will have the judges take a quick look at them uh, for a few minutes, um, and then we will invite up the one that sounds most interesting to get a verbal pitch. Actually, um, let's just do the, uh, the sentences now. So as soon as you uh, get those up, uh, you can uh, bring them up while we're setting this up and uh, set them right on the table over there. So we have our full attention here. We're going to have, all right, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come and get yours. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start this. Um, I'm going to come get a few last pieces of paper. I'll walk around and uh, please uh, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, hello. My name is George Monaco. Uh, I'm the Sharks. Thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, let me present my, uh, my business to you. If they're talking to the mic, they can't. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, hello, and uh, I'm Rich Thank you so much for listening to my presentation today. Uh, my company is called Apps That Fit, and we are a Chicago-based LLC. I've been in operation for a couple of years. Uh, we operate a product called My Gym, and My Gym is addressing an important problem. Obesity is a growing problem in the United States. Uh, here you're seeing charts of how the proportion of people who are obese is increasing and how uh, actually many uh, experts think that this trend is just going to continue. What my gym does to address the problem is we build custom branded native mobile apps for fitness clubs. They pay us a subscription fee every month and we've been able to build over 100 apps uh, that service over 3,000 locations that, uh, that are really driving greater engagement for fitness clubs. So to be clear, every club is paying us money every month to have an app that is imp improving their retention. Uh, currently, we serve over 193,000 active users. That means that they've used the app in the last 30 days. We've had over 800,000 downloads. A lot of that's driven by UFC, a lot of that churn because they have a lot of people who, uh, who download it thinking they're gonna find fights, but really it's, it's about the UFC fitness clubs. <laughs> Uh, so as I mentioned, we service over 100 uh, 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 clubs in the fitness industry. 
Let me show you a couple of the apps that we've built. Uh, this is the core, uh, I'm sorry, this one's actually the, uh, the YogaWorks app. And what you can see it does is it delivers the class schedules, it helps people find locations, it helps them to deliver the news about what's coming on in the what's going on in the clubs. Uh, and they have a video and retention program, and we've mobilized those programs for them. Uh, this is an app that we built for, uh, you know, it's a different design, it's a little bit more visual, but you can see it's a lot of the same common elements. So one of the thing, things that we do is we white label these apps and we get a lot of scale, we can really get the costs down for the club. And what you can see, what happens there is you can, you can uh, scroll so you can see lots of different experiences. So we can, we can mobilize experiences like they have a nutrition program or programs that we have like Fit Friends where you can put in your fitness interests and you can chat with other members uh, based on their fitness interests. The key value proposition we have for fitness clubs is uh, we reduce their churn. We give them a ton of data. We have gigabytes and gigabytes of data. Uh, they can know what membership cards were put in and whether or not those, those members are churning. Uh, and they can also see a lot of information in aggregate and they can see how people are using their apps. The markets we're going after uh, look like this. There's over 10,000 fitness clubs, commercial clubs in the United States with revenue of over a half a million. And there's over 20,000 mission-based clubs, YMCA's and Parks and Recs. And we go after them as well. Uh, we, there's 1,200 universities and 1,000 corporate wellness programs that we target. Our average price point is just under $400. And if you run the math, that's a market opportunity of $119 million. But we don't just service the clubs. We look at the ecosystem like this. Fitness, uh, fitness clubs, yeah, we service them. We just launched the Fitness Formula Clubs app. We also do Chicago Metro YMCA. Core Power Yoga is about to launch. Uh, and we do Chicago Athletic Club. Lots of clubs that you know. But we also are paid to help other fitness brands reach our customers. So NetPulse, Les Mills, uh, all these other brands have paid us to either build an app or to put experiences uh, in front of customers that use our apps. Uh, and we also work with software management companies, so the member management companies and uh, reward programs. And we're really excited about the Apple Watch. I just got to throw that out. Uh, the team is very small and agile. It's basically me and my tech lead, and we've got some really great advisors. Uh, uh, Jay Schwann is the founder of Solstice Mobile, uh, so we get access to uh, Solstice resources at really good rates. Bill McBride is the, uh, the founder of uh, uh, Active Sports and also was the former uh, chairman of the board for URSA, which is the industry's largest trade organization. Uh, Mark Ackler, uh, I understand you're going to join. Good guy. Uh, so our financials are very strong, we have no debt. Uh, me and my business partner Jay have uh, bootstrapped it. Uh, we have an estimated revenue of $500,000 for 2014, we're at like 425 of that right now, so we're really close, and 80% and of our revenue is subscription revenue, so, uh, you know, so it's pretty predictable. Um, and what really differentiates us is that we've built this platform that automates the deployment of apps and the maintenance of apps, so we can deploy apps for 100 to 170 bucks, and we can maintain them for 30 bucks a month. Uh, and uh, growing through partnerships, uh, I'll just mention, we do not spend a lot of money on marketing. All of our growth comes from word of mouth. We used to spend money doing trade magazines and trade shows and stuff, we really cut that back. What we found is pretty much all of our customers come through word of mouth, so we're just wasting our money. Okay, cool. Uh, so, oh, there you go. so, uh, uh, I thought I, there was supposed to be a slide in there. My ask is please uh, connect us with your, uh, with your network. And, uh, and we are looking for funding uh, $100,000 uh, for 10% of the company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm a little confused on the math. I think you said $400 per club? Uh, yeah, yeah, per, well, per, per customer. Per like and, over 100. I saw 3,000 clubs, so I was expecting 1.2 million, and I didn't yeah, know yeah, if that yeah. was 400 per month, 400 per year, 400 one time. Yeah. Can you explain your revenue model a little bit? I can. Uh, so when we say 3,000 locations, some clubs are multiple locations. So do you charge more? Uh, we do. We do. Um, so you know, some clubs pay a lot. Some clubs pay. Uh, sorry. The average. So the average price point is 
on a per customer basis, uh, and it's just under 300 per month. So on average, we have some that pay over 3,000, and then we have some that pay. We have some that we're like giving a pretty nice deal to, like a couple of staff locations because we want to get the whole thing. So you don't have 3,000 customers? We do not have 3,000 separate customers, no. We have, have like 100. We have like 100 customers. Yeah. 160. Yeah. And is it per month? Yeah, every, uh, all of our payments are, you know, for monthly. Monthly. Our billing right. monthly revenue. Got it. You seem to, you seem to bring up that you have to Sticky. What makes people come back? What do you think is driving the true attention for the cloud? Yeah, so uh, two things that really drive uh, uh, people coming back. Uh, one is uh, you can create a personalized schedule across locations. So you say, I, want, I like these locations, I like these classes, uh, and these instructors, and you can create that. Otherwise, you've got to sift through a whole bunch of stuff, and that's really annoying. So people who go to classes, which is about 40% of people who are members of fitness clubs, there's no other app that does that well, um, uh, you know, particularly in a white label capacity. Uh, it's, a, it's also, it's, it's normally the membership card for the clubs that we work with. So if you're an FFC member, you put your membership card in, you can get rid of that thing and you can just show it. So that, that drives a lot of attention as well. I saw that you had something on um, your one example that says Zen Points. Is that implemented through the... <laughs> Is that yep. implemented through the... Yep. Okay, so yep. you do gamify it. We have, so we have our own gamification platform. The more you check in, the more you can refer friends. So that's an off-the-shelf sort of configurable uh, tile. They're doing that up at World Health in Canada. Uh, Zenpoints is actually uh, the Perkville partner I mentioned, and it's a, it's a private label uh, 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 way that they're gamifying their, uh, 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 their product. Yes, well, it's either to, to advertise or for some kind of access. Uh, sometimes it's data, like how many people are liking sure. my club. Okay, so that, that was my question. So what, what are you doing with the data that you're, that you're gathering? Uh, we've been really focused on building great product, and I hate to say we haven't had a ton of resources to, to go out and, and sell the data that we have, uh, or even to explain to our customers what great data they have. So one of the things we want to do with this funding is to improve our account management so we can actually dive into that data with our clubs and, and, and prove out a much you know, higher value population. So um, obviously this is a, a growing market, so I like that. Um, you said you have no debt and you built up this point. I see the B2B to C white label as a conservative play. Uh, it's a quick way to get money, but if this market is really big, why don't you do a two-sided market, a consumer focus, and lower your Increase your gross margins and just go big. Why not? What's what's all the other? You mean uh, have a have an app that's like a class pass app? Like uh, you know you have you have a side that is the employer side and you have a side that is the senior side and they can yeah. use that. Yeah. You know what? Why, why, why is it that your question? Yeah. It seems to me like this has scaling issues, implementation, video services, gyms. Yeah. Um, if you're going to go big, why not go BC? That's a great question. And one of the things that we've implemented, and I didn't talk about it, is uh, we've networked our clubs. So if you uh, use the Chicago Club Club app, for example, you can buy passes to get into uh, in-shape in -shape customers and buy passes to Chicago Club Club. Uh, and we've implemented that to mimic the URSA Passport program, where you can go to a club if you're more if they're part of that network, and 1,800 clubs are, uh, then you can you can uh, have this, this virtual reciprocal exchange. So, so we're doing that, and the apps, uh, you can actually take a picture of your credit card, you use Stripe for payments, uh, and you can buy passes to get into other clubs. So we just started doing that, and I don't talk about it much because it confuses people. So. so I'm confused about the economics. So you said you have 500000 in revenue. It sounds like your cost of goods sold setting these things up isn't that big, and you have two people. Yeah. So why do you need another $100,000? Yeah, so I, I, I should be clear. We have two core members. Uh, we have five people working on the app full time. Uh, so you know, we pay Solstice at cost for their resources. Um, uh, and so there, there is additional cost to it. But mostly what they're doing is they're building new products. Like we're building out the, the PASS program. We just built out the, the, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the personalized schedules piece. So when I, when I say that our maintenance costs are low, we're investing in new product all the time. Thank you. Uh, no, it's not a yeah. If you can do that, then you Okay, so, do you guys think that in the next minute or two, I don't want to bore everyone to death here, uh, you would be able to pick one from those that you find interesting, or do you just want to shuffle them up and do them randomly? What do you guys think? <laughs> we'll, we'll find them. Okay, all right. Take a few minutes, we can have a little check your phone break. <laughs> yes, switch your battery. Winner. Um, and I will say also that uh, we were all really impressed uh, with how many entries we got on such short notice. Uh, it's a room full of great entrepreneurs uh, where you might not have all the stars align through all the time, but you find a way to make it happen. So um, everyone was really impressed. Okay, so we are going to bring up Valerie back. And on her card, she says that Chocolate Uplift provides chocolate services to the industry, such as consulting and importing, and to the public, such as tours and travel. So Valerie, you can come up and uh, give, uh, I mean, you have up to five minutes, but I'd imagine this can be a little bit shorter without collateral. Um, and we want to know. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm Valerie Beck. I eat chocolate every day. Who's with me? Yeah, right? Nature's perfect food. So Chocolate Uplift is actually my rebranding name. My current business name is Chicago Chocolate Tours. We're a tour company and we've expanded. So what Chocolate Uplift does is really two main buckets of services. It's all chocolate all the time. And the first bucket is to the trade, to chocolate makers, uh, to nations that grow cacao from which chocolate is made. So basically on the, the uh, trade side, we help people who make chocolate, who grow chocolate, improve whatever it is that they want to improve. So consulting, importing, distributing, food broking, I'll get brokerage. I'll give you a quick example. My newest client is the nation of Ecuador. I'm so excited. Ecuador, by the way, is, I believe, the best kept secret in the Western Hemisphere. Have you been? Beautiful country, amazing people, amazing food. They're the sixth largest grower of cocoa uh, in the world right now, but they have very limited production inside their borders of actually turning the cocoa into chocolate. So one thing that they want to do is not only make the raw material, but they want to make the finished product. So I'm helping them and some projects related to that. The other side is the customer side. We take uh, customers on tours to all the best chocolate shops in Chicago. These are popular with bachelorette parties, corporate outings, and it's all a small batch. So we're not into taking people to the big brands because you know where to get a Hershey bar or a box of Godiva anytime you want. We're into promoting slavery free chocolate. So chocolate that is fair trade, 70% uh, of all of the chocolate on the market today is grown in West Africa on farms that use some very dubious labor practices, including child slave labor. It's really the dark, dirty secret of the chocolate industry. And the reporting of this problem is coming out more and more, which is a positive thing. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, disinfectant will be able to uh, collectively, as an industry, solve that problem. Uh, I'll sooner rather than later, right? It's, it's, it's insane. Um, so in any case, on the customer side, we focus on small batch artisan chocolatiers and pastry chefs, and we take customers to visit these shops. It's very educational on the tours. People learn about the health benefits, the history of chocolate, and of course, there's lots of sampling. We can ruin your appetite for dinner uh, on the tour, which is, is our goal there. Uh, the other thing we do on the customer side is travel. So people have enjoyed taking the tours so much, and we've expanded that to other cities by the way, Philadelphia, uh, Boston, and etc. And so the travel club started because I go to chocolate shows in New York and Miami and different places every year. I used to be a lawyer, by the way, and all my lawyer friends are jealous because now instead of going to American Bar Association <laughs> conventions, I go to chocolate conventions. But in any case, I started bringing customers with me to the uh, chocolate shows around the country and around the world, and so that is how the travel club developed. So our next travel, travel club trip, for example, is to Ecuador. We're combining the business side and the, uh, the customer side, uh, which is which is a lot of fun, and we'll be bringing you to Coco Ponds in Ecuador.
or you'll get to go. Uh, we'll go together to the farms. We'll see how the cocoa is grown. We'll get to hack some pods right off the tree, open them up, and eat the, the delicious pulp and, and the, the seeds right out of the pod, and then see that whole process of how the chocolate goes on its journey to becoming chocolate. So what we're to wrap up and doing right now, again, is rebranding and really putting these different services all into one cohesive uh, website, into cohesive ways of explaining what we is the, what it is that we do. But the bottom line is that the mission is uplift through chocolate. And it's really helping people who are in the chocolate world and people who eat the chocolate world, uh, really helping to improve that industry, to help the different players in that industry be better at what they're doing. And then ultimately the customer wins because better chocolate, ethical chocolate, means a more delicious world for us all. Keep eating chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> So that was a great, spontaneous pitch, <laughs> but, but, you're an entrepreneur and you didn't have an ask. Oh, so my ask would be two things actually, thank you. <laughs> the first side of the uh, of the ask is on the customer side. Uh, I am looking for, for uh, investors for Cocoa Farms in Ecuador right now. This could be somebody who is already a chocolate maker and wants to set up a branch or an additional facility uh, in the country of Ecuador. This could be somebody who's an investor and says, well, hey, let's get the players in place. We'll make some sort of a joint venture a partnership, whatever it might be. So investment in, uh, in Ecuador uh, cacao is ask number one. Ask number two is to simply come out and take a chocolate tour. <laughs> We're starting our uh, the customer side, our uh, hot chocolate tours up again this season, and uh, uh, bring your your uh, uh, corporate, your, your your office team, uh, bring your mom, and come out and, and take one of our tours. Does that count for asks? Thank you. 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 How do you make money for the tours and? You get a piece of sales and they go to Great question, yeah. On the tour side, we make money simply by selling tickets. Uh, it's $40 per person to come out and take a chocolate tour on a public tour, $50 per person on a private tour. Um, I very purposefully do not ask for a commission from the stores. That was a model that I considered, of course, but I decided not to do that because I wanted to really show the stores what's in it for them and that if they treat my tour customers like gold, my customers are going to spend more money in the store and they're going to return. So I keep myself out of that side of it and it, it's actually that decision has actually really paid off for me in more ways than I even would have anticipated because now that we're going uh, for example into the business side these stores are saying that I'm supporting them and I'm helping them and now they're my customers for consulting they're my my test marketers for uh, uh, the cacao that I'm bringing back from Ecuador and, and El Salvador wants to get in on the game so there's a lot of activity happening in Latin America and the stores that I have not taken a commission from are really seeing me as their ally so that as these new opportunities open up, they're even more uh, excited to participate. Thank you. All right, that will uh, conclude uh, Shark Tank today. So thank you everyone uh, for uh, coming out and if you'll please have one more round of applause for all of our uh, brave presenters today. And also for our brave judges uh, for coming out and giving their insight.